Good morning, and welcome back to the Free Zone Project. This morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about what might be accomplished in the first 10 years of creating the Free Zone. Initially, uh, the most important thing is going to be to set up a legal trust so that any donations and or revenue generated by fundraising efforts will go to their intended purpose and can't be accessed by any single person. Probably have to have, uh, you know, the board basically sign off on all purchases or all use of these funds that are held in trust. Second will um, obviously be to choose the initial board. And those folks will be responsible for overseeing both the preparation and execution of the first phase of the plan. Uh, I figure we'll probably have one person kind of specialize and take ownership over specific aspects of both the preparation and the execution. So, um, after that, obviously, we have to start raising money, and we're going to need input from the whole community as to the best way to do that. Um, I'm certainly willing to start another YouTube channel that's not related to this and, um, you know, I don't know, do something, whatever you all think is best. Um, that also aligns with something that I know about and uh, that will be one source of revenue. Donations will be another. Um, merchandise will probably be another. Um, I've even thought about um, holding like uh, contests um, like raffles for valuable prizes um, once we get a little bit of money stowed away we can actually use a little bit if the people decide it's the right thing to do use some of it to buy you know let's say items that most people couldn't afford to buy and just raffle them off for a few bucks um a few bucks, you know, per, per ticket. Um, there's all different ways to raise money. And it's never been my forte, so hopefully someone else will take the lead on that. Someone or some group of people will take the lead on that who are better at it than I am. Um, but once the revenue starts flowing in, then we need to seriously sit back and make a plan. Um, and although I go over this in extensive detail on the Free Zone Project page, which is located on Facebook. Um, I'm going to break it down as simply as I can and as briefly as I can here, because there's just a million and one things to do. Uh, the scope of the project is such that it's going to require the participation of a lot of the community to get things done and make things happen on the way to actually founding the, the Free Zone. So... Um, one of the first things we need to do is come up with a list of criteria that we desire in a plot of land. And then we need to start going to look at different plots of land, but we need to do it in an organized fashion. So um, as a suggestion, I think we should appoint scouting teams, probably four people, to go out and check out these sites. And I mean check them out thoroughly. Um, you know, uh, pictures, video, um, LIDAR readings, we need temperature, we need wind, we need moisture, we need soil composition, um, we need a general idea of who is living in the immediate area to spot potential threats or make inroads with potential allies. Um, and as such, you know, the scouts are not only going to have to be trained, but fairly well equipped, and they're going to have to know how to use um, a, a decent variety of test equipment in order to get us the readings that we need. And once that's done, we can seriously take a look at each site and decide which is going to be best for us. And it's going to boil down to a lot of different factors. Um, you know, um, some of the things that we have to look for is arable land to grow crops if there's not already land that's um, 
prepped for cultivation. For instance, if we were to just go out and buy a large farm, say a thousand acres or so, um, and really, even though I didn't go into that, in my posts on the Free Zone project, that's something that needs to be seriously discussed because doing that initially would not only cost a lot less um, than the projected initial budget of the Free Zone, which is $50 million, but it would also obviously give us a source of revenue so that fundraising becomes, um, you know, pretty much a moot point. We work the farm and those profits are then used to, uh, to further the goals of the free zone. Buy us all the materials and equipment that we need to, to actually turn it from a simple farm into an actual community. Um, or, alternately, we can take the money from the farm profits and buy a completely different plot of land and that plot would encompass all the other facilities of the free zone, all the non-farming activities. So residential facilities, uh, medical facilities, educational facilities, research facilities, um, you know, things like that. Everything that doesn't involve farming could be accomplished on the second plot of land. Obviously, um, there's some serious drawbacks to that, not the least of which is that your revenue is separated from everything else like literally separated and anybody can come between you and it at any time so it's something to think about at any rate um, once we do zero in on a plot of land then we can start making crucial decisions like what kind of clothing we need to buy for everyone um, what kind of other equipment is going to be specific to certain environments like will we need to winterize vehicles um, and then of course you have equipment that is going to be necessary no matter where we go so one of the things that you'll find out about me once we get to that is that I'm very very serious about keeping the free zone as safe as possible for the people who live there and uh, that's going to require you know, security expenditures in body armor, in weapons, um, you know, uh, I'm not a violent person, I'm not a, a person who thinks that violence is a good way to solve anything, but I am realistic. This is not a peaceful planet and we're not a peaceful species. So you know, unfortunately, that part has to be taken into account, and security is expensive. Everything about it is expensive. The equipment is expensive, the training is expensive, and, uh, you know, unlike a lot of other activities that are going to require extensive expenditures, uh, the only payback is indirect. Like I said, you know, the payback you get from security is not having things go wrong that are caused by other humans. And, of course, environmental threats can be um, categorized under security as well. Anyway, I'm going to talk all about security in its own segment. Um, but knowing where we're going will allow us to procure the equipment and provisions that we'll need for that specific environment. In addition to that, we're going to have to spend money getting everyone a physical, getting everyone vaccinated against local um, bacterial and uh, not bacterial local viral infections for vaccinations um, we're going to have to have a ready supply of correct antibiotics to combat any kind of bacterial um, infections and possibly antifungal as well depends how humid it is and how nasty uh, the local fungus is basically so that needs to be considered um, from the very beginning I'm a strong believer in the fact that we need um, medical care. Obviously, it's a, I think it's a human right. If you're going to live in a society, your health should be a priority for that society. Um, but I don't think we should participate in a specific or in a um, traditional insurance type of scam, because that's what insurance is. It's a scam. Um, 
And with the kind of money that we'll be generating, the kind of money that we control, there's no reason to do that. We just straight up hire, you know, a doctor and a nurse, or maybe in the a beginning, uh, a physician's assistant and a nurse, whatever. And, you know, they're just there. Their job is to be there. Basically, um, we'll set up a schedule, or we, as a suggestion, we could set up a schedule for, you know, um, biannual checkups every six months. You drop by the doctor's office, get your temperature taken, have them, let them listen to you breathe, um, work your reflexes, etc., etc., just a basic checkup. And then all the other time, they'll basically just be getting paid to to study and train and be on call, you know? So it'll be real easy money as far as, you know, being a doctor goes. Being in the medical profession at all, doctors run around all day. Yeah, they make mad money, but, you know, they run around all day. So... That is kind of how I would do it, and it'll be a hell of a lot cheaper than buying insurance, especially once the population grows. Um, obviously, we'll need um, provisions, that is, anything that is used or worn out. So clothing, medical supplies, food, water, um, and a way to generate the water until we can actually get the water processing facilities online. Um, that's not a huge problem. We can probably just buy some relatively inexpensive materials and build our own still. It's not a difficult thing to do. Um, and that would be the cheapest way to do it. Uh, the other thing that would be considerably more expensive would be to invest in a water processing truck, kind of like the same thing the military uses when they're out in the field to process fresh water for the troops. I think they're able to produce up to like a thousand gallons of pure water a day which is obviously more than enough for a hundred people. <clears throat> but as the population grows, it's just not going to be a viable solution. So maybe we don't spend the money on, because I'm sure there's trucks are half a million dollars or more, and that's conservative. Um, maybe we do just build a large still, which could probably be done for $10,000 and would allow us to to purify the same thousand gallons of water, just do it a lot more simply and inexpensively. It might not be quite as absolutely pure as something that's produced by one of these trucks, but you know, you get something 99.8, 99.9% nine .9 pure, so long as there's no heavy metals present, you're good. Um, so, as far as food goes, um, the more elaborate the diet that we want to have for ourselves, the more difficult that becomes. At its most basic level, you can just buy a, a ton of uh, rice and canned beans and some spices and supplement that with uh, fresh meat from game. Um, now, I know there's a lot of anti-hunting sentiment out there, but the bottom line is um, take an animal like a suscrofa, uh, the wild pig, originated in uh, Asia and has been introduced for various reasons to every, almost every continent. The only one wouldn't be Antarctica. And every continent that it's been introduced to, it has quickly escaped and bred out of control and been unable to be contained. So, um, and the thing about pigs. I know that they're intelligent, sensitive animals, but they also have no concept of private property. So if we don't keep the pigs under the control, they can and will come onto the farmland and start rampaging through the crops. So they're not only at that point taking our food, they're taking our money. And, uh, you know, so we're going to have to find a way to deal with them anyway. And so my idea is, well, if we're going to have to do something with them, we may as well use all of the animal that we can. We're going to want fresh meat, and we're probably going to need fresh meat to supplement whatever food we bring along. And frankly, after, you know, a week, a week and a half of beans and rice, I think everybody's going to be ready for something different. 
And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we don't have to deprive ourselves to that extent with food. But like I said, um, the more elaborate a diet that we plan for ourselves, the more expensive it'll be and possibly the more difficult it'll be to keep the food fresh. So like any, any perishables that we bring along, uh, you know, well, m milk only lasts about three to four weeks before it goes bad, no matter what you do. Under ideal conditions, um, eggs last longer, but they still don't last forever. Meat obviously needs to be kept under refrigeration. So the more elaborate diet that we plan for ourselves, the more equipment we need to buy and the more money we need to spend and the more time we need to devote to, to just that aspect of survival. So I personally am in favor of a, a very Spartan diet. But that's something that can be discussed. Um, what else? Um, we talked a little bit about security. I'll get into more of that later. The other things that we'll need to think about buying are all the equipment that we'll need for the scout teams to test the thing. We'll need to either purchase or assemble vehicles um, I had an idea where if we can just find some uh, a decent number of um, scrap motorcycle frames that aren't bent we can certainly pretty easily uh, design and build our own electric cycles I think it's important that we try to be responsible and use as little fossil fuels as possible from the very beginning so um, and uh, there are any number of um, plans and blueprints for for these things already so even if we don't follow them it'll give us a good idea of what needs to be done to produce an electric cycle because I haven't looked that much into it but I can certainly you know do some research if the people decide that that's the way they want to go um, and I think participating in that kind of project, doing that for ourselves, designing and building our own vehicles right from the beginning is going to give us a leg up in case we want to break into that market later on in a commercial way. Um, at least in the beginning though, um, our heavy construction equipment and a lot of the heavier vehicles are not going to run on electricity. So we're going to have to find, um, a place to store fuel, probably diesel. We're going to have to store, well, you know, everything. Hand tools, hand power tools. Uh, the smaller construction uh, machines can go inside a building at night for security. And then the larger ones can be parked right outside that building, and that particular security detail would have the responsibility of watching that shit overnight. Pardon my language. Um... There's the cost of construction materials. Um, you know, initially, the money that we would have to come up with to get our initial shelters constructed is rather minimal. Um, you know, concrete's not expensive. We need to pour and seal foundations, but that's not expensive. And it's not, it's not an intellectually demanding task, but it is pretty physical to pour concrete. Um, especially if, to sho if you have to shovel the wet stuff in manually. It gets real heavy real quick. Um, but in addition to that, we would have to consider the initial purchase of steel or aluminum buildings. And this is assuming we're in a moderate climate. If we're not, we can still use those kind of buildings, but we have to insulate them. Any place that's going to get really cold, those kind of buildings lack insulation, and uh, it wouldn't be pleasant to sleep overnight in one in sub-zero temperatures, let me put it that way. You wouldn't necessarily freeze to death, but you're going to be damn cold. Let's see, we talked about, um, you know, transportation in the free zone. I'm... Uh, I'm kind of up to uh, open for anybody's suggestions on this. You know, there are basically two ways to go about it, and that is to 
stick to the traditional model of private property and you know people go out and buy cars trucks whatever blah 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 or we can set aside a portion of the budget to buy a fleet of homogenous vehicles get you know initially for a hundred people you'd probably only really need about 10 vehicles because not everybody's going to want to go somewhere or needs to go somewhere or do something at a specific time and then that would save us money in uh, maintenance because you're already able to purchase a supply of um, parts that we know are, are going to be needed like fuel filters air filters um, spark plugs belts um, Anything that is specific to that model of vehicle that we know is going to wear out can be purchased up front and then we have all our maintenance parts on hand. So if we do have an unexpected problem with a vehicle, it can be fixed quickly and otherwise they'll be used, you know, on a regularly scheduled maintenance program. Let's see. Um, there are decisions that we have to make regarding hygiene. I mentioned it briefly before, but, you know, we're going to need shampoo, soap, deodorant, um, toothpaste, mouthwash, these kind of things. Um, and when the time comes, we're going to have to make a decision on things like napkins and toilet paper. I made the point before that these kind of things obviously not only destroy forests, but they really complicate our position when it comes to dealing with solid waste. Everything that you flush down the toilet or, you know, throw into the garbage has to end up somewhere. And so we have to be careful that we're throwing away the bare minimum of stuff. So from the very beginning, we may want to consider alternate methods. Now. You know, we can use things like porta potties um, in the beginning, but they have their own problems. You know, they're chemical toilets. And I have no idea how bad those chemicals are for the environment. Probably not great. So that's a problem that needs to be solved. And would love everybody's input on feedback on that. Um, same thing goes with um, something as simple as napkins. You know, are we going to use paper? Or when the time comes and we have settled in and everyone starts to move into their own individual apartments, should we then just issue everyone a complete set of reusable containers for everything they're going to need at their, at their house, you know? And by the way, those containers should be made from recyclable materials, either glass or metal. And that can be as simple or elaborate as the people decide it needs to be because at some point we need to talk about, you know, cooking and feeding people after the pioneer group gets, gets the initial structures in place and other people start moving in. When we build our residential building, do we, do we want to build it with a kitchen in every unit? Or do we want to have kitchens, say two kitchens on every floor that are kind of communal kitchens? Or do we want to have no kitchens, no full kitchens, I should say. There would still be, obviously, an area in the unit for you to wash, um, wash your stuff up. And uh, possibly, you know, like a microwave type of deal so you can reheat food. You don't necessarily have to go to the kitchen. You know, um, I know that sounds inconvenient, but limiting those kind of facilities, cooking facilities specifically, in the residential buildings would make laying out the building a whole lot easier. You know, instead of, if there's 20 units on a floor, or 50 units on a floor, instead of laying out 50 sets of um gas pipes, for instance, if there's natural gas available and we want to use that for cooking. And um, if that's an option, I do think the people should consider it because anybody who's cooked in a commercial kitchen that uses gas or, or any kitchen where gas is available, they know how superior it is to an electric type of arrangement. 
Um, but that has to be decided as well. Um, I thought initially... Um, well, nah, it's, too, it's too soon to talk about that. I'll move on. Anyway, uh, as you all can tell, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot to purchase. Um, there's a lot to account for before we ever think about moving somewhere. And then there's a lot to do once we get there. So, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about all this. Um, please leave a comment below and tell me what you think. And if you have any ideas, please leave them. The Free Zone is all about community participation. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank you for listening and uh, hope you have a great day. If you enjoyed this, please give the video a like and consider subscribing to support the Free Zone Project. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you the best. Thanks again.